welcome to Find Your Way Home. I have a very special show for you because nobody who's Catholic really enjoys it when the Blessed Mother gets a bad rap. And the Blessed Mother in Medjugorje gets a bad rap, we have discovered, because of false reasons. So in this show, I have with me Anne Vusick, who is an expert in Medjugorje, and what I really want you to do if you have doubts about Medjugorje or you have one of these common objections is to watch all the way through because I truly believe we as Catholics owe it to ourselves to be fully informed before we speak against potentially the Blessed Mother because in speaking against her and what she's doing in the world erroneously could cost souls. This is extremely serious, and so I believe I found one of the best in terms of answering our questions, and the questions that Anne is going to speak to are the following. First of all, the church's response. The local bishop has condemned it, people say, therefore Medjugorje is condemned. Anne Vusick is going to speak to that. She's going to talk about the objection that Catholics should not travel to Medjugorje until it has been approved. And specifically, she's going to talk about Medjugorje going on too long, it's too commercialized. The visionaries might be faking it. They might be lying as evidenced by Vishka flinching when poked in the eye. But Anne, thank you so much for being here and thank you for having researched this for so many years. <laughs> Would you please <laughs> tell people a bit about yourself and how it all started in terms of you and Medjugorje? Well, first of all, thank you, Christine, so much for uh, inviting me here. This is such an important topic in our times. As you said, Medjugorje is such an important place in the church today. This is too important to get wrong. You know, if somebody doesn't is not interested in Medjugorje, that's fine. You can you can be not interested. But if you make a negative judgment about it based on false information, that I think is something that that we need to address. And so my my goal here is not to try to convince anybody that Medjugorje is real or not real. My goal is to lay out the answers to those most common objections and you you discern all that yourself. Take the information that we're going to talk about that I'm going to share and please pray about it, discern it, research it yourself. To You don't have to take my word for it. If you just do a little bit of research, you'll find you'll find all of that stuff yourself. So my goal is to really lay out for your viewers what the answer is to some of these most common objections. In terms of my own connection, I just want to share with you a little bit about how I am connected to these events and uh, how long I've been following th these events. So first of all, I was born in a village just two miles away from Medjugorje. So I am Croatian, uh, but my family moved to the United States when I was two years old. And I basically grew up in the United States, which is hopefully why I don't have any accent when I speak English. The summer of 1981, for those of you who know the history of Medjugorje, the summer of 1981 is when Our Lady first appeared in Medjugorje, June 24th, 1981 to be exact. That summer, two weeks before the apparitions began, my family decided to go on a family vacation to visit our homeland. And our home base during that summer vacation was our village two miles away from Medjugorje. We were there two and a half months that summer, and I heard about the apparitions on the fourth day of the apparitions, June 27th. It was a day that it was my before and after moment, the, who I was before the moment that I heard about the apparitions and who I was in the moment after I heard about my about the apparitions. My life completely changed. I fell in love with the Lord. I fell in love with the church. I spent every single day that I could going to Medjugorje that summer. And so I witnessed these events from the very, very beginning. And as as I uh, as I grew and got older, one of the things that happened for me was a passion was born in my heart because I saw how God changed my heart through Medjugorje. The passion of my heart became helping people understand the workings of the Lord through this most incredible place, this most incredible gift that the Lord has given the church and the world, Medjugorje, these apparitions of Our Lady in Medjugorje. It became the passion of my life to help other people understand what is happening in Medjugorje. And so literally from the fourth day of the apparitions 
the mission of my life has been helping people to understand Medjugorje better. I've done that through bringing thousands of people to Medjugorje over the course of 25 years at this point. I've spoken all over the country about Medjugorje. I've written articles about Medjugorje. I'm working on several books concurrently about Medjugorje. There's so many things that the Lord the doors that the Lord has opened for me to help people understand, including if you watched a previous video that we made, a Hollywood movie that is being made about Medjugorje right now as well. So the Lord has really allowed me to have the opportunity to speak about Medjugorje, to be a part of these events, literally from the fourth day of the apparitions. And so it's from all of those years of experience that I come to you today to share with you what we're going to be talking about. So I am a product of Anne as well. She guided one of the pilgrimages that I went on and did a great job. She taught me Croatian. No, she didn't. But, um, <laughs> it, it's just a wonderful job. And Anne, would you first respond to these objections regarding the church's response? And the the main objection, not approved, the bishop condemned it. Can Can you flesh that out? Because that's so important. Yes. This is the most important one, because what we hear more often than anything else is the local bishop has condemned Medjugorje, so Medjugorje is condemned. And what I say to that is, yes, that's true, but, and the but is what needs to be expanded on. What does that mean? So let me just first say that since the apparitions first began in 1981, three bishops have served in the role of bishop of the Diocese of Mostar, which is the diocese that Medjugorje is located in. The first bishop was Bishop Havo Janic, the second one was Bishop Ratko Peric, and the third and current one is Bishop Petar Palic. So those three bishops have served, and Petar Palic is currently serving in the role of bishop of, of the Diocese of Mostar. The first two bishops, Bishop, Petar, bishop Havo Janic and Bishop Ratko Peric, both of them have publicly condemned Medjugorje. Now, that needs to be, before anybody jumps on that, that needs to be explained. So let me explain what, what happened there. When the apparitions first began, Bishop Pavo Janic, he initially actually believed in the events, and he publicly stated that he believed in the events. But a few weeks or maybe months, I don't remember, afterwards, he had a change of heart. Why he had a change of heart, that's irrelevant to what we're talking about right now. But he did have a change, in, a change of heart about the apparitions. He ended up forming a commission that investigated Medjugorje. And in 1986, that commission came up with a finding. And that finding was that Medjugorje was not authentic and that it should be condemned by the church, that it was condemned by him and the commission that investigated it. And for many people, they think, well, end of story, right? Because when some kind of a phenomenon happens in the church, the normal procedure is that the local bishop investigate that, and whatever decision that local bishop makes, that's the final ruling. But guess what? That's not what happened with Medjugorje. When Bishop Pavo Janic submitted his findings to the Vatican, Cardinal Ratzinger, as head of that congregation, did some interesting things. Not only did he reject those findings, so he basically said, I am not acknowledging these, these negative findings about Medjugorje. But in addition to that, he actually formed a new commission to investigate Medjugorje himself. That new commission consisted of the bishops of former Yugoslavia. This was still the country of Yugoslavia. And so the new commission consisted of all of the bishops of former Yugoslavia. And guess what else he did? Not only did he reject those findings and create a new commission, he also took the authority away from that local bishop and all of his successors to make a definitive ruling about Medjugorje. So the local bishop still had authority over the parish of St. James because it was a parish in his diocese, right? He still had authority to make decisions about, you know, which priests were going to be assigned there, matters related to the running of a parish, all of that, that remained in his authority. But what did not remain in his authority was to make any kind of authoritative statements about the phenomenon of the apparitions, him and all of his successors. So basically what what that meant was that his statement that Medjugorje was not authentic, that was entirely his personal opinion. And when the bishop that came after him, Bishop Ratko Peric, very publicly made statements that Medjugorje was not authentic, that he condemned Medjugorje, that people should not come to Medjugorje, those statements as well were statements of his personal opinion and not binding on the faithful. It would be no different as 
as, as if my own bishop in my own di- home diocese made a statement saying that Medjugorje is not authentic. Well, you know, he can have that opinion if he wants to, but that opinion of the bishop of my diocese is not binding on the faithful. In the same way, the decision or the thinking of the bishop of the diocese of Mostad about the events of Medjugorje is not binding on the faithful. So the new commission that investigated Medjugorje, the bishops of the former Yugoslavia, they met in 1991 in a town called Zadar on the Croatian coast, and they came up with a list of basically uh, recommendations or findings about Medjugorje. And this is very important to understand because this actually is what the official teaching of the church is related to Medjugorje. And that document is called the 1991 Zadar. Zadar is Z-A-D-A-R. You can look it up yourselves. The 1991 Zadar Declaration about Medjugorje. And in the Zadar Declaration, they were given three choices. They could rule Medjugorje is authentic. Secondly, they could rule that Medjugorje is not authentic. And thirdly, they could rule that we do not yet know, and so we will continue to watch. The 1991 Zadab Declaration basically chose that third option, said, we are not saying it's authentic, we're not saying it's not authentic, but we are going to watch these events. And in the meantime, we are going to allow pilgrims to travel to Medjugorje, and we are going to allow priests to accompany pilgrims for their spiritual needs. That's the official position of the church. Not that the bishop has condemned it, but that is the official position of the church. More recently, and this is so important to know, especially for our times, in 2010, Pope Benedict established a new commission to investigate Medjugorje. They completed their work in 2014. The recommendations of that commission are that the first seven days of the apparitions be approved. And let me just state right now, it doesn't mean that those first seven days are approved. It means that the commission recommended that they be approved, but we're waiting on the Vatican to make a determination about that. The next thing that they that, that happened as a result of that second commission was that the Vatican appointed what's called an apostolic visitor, a bishop whose entire role is to serve in Medjugorje to oversee the spiritual needs of, of the pilgrims there. And the third thing that happened as a result of that third of that commission is that in 2018, the Vatican approved of official pilgrimages to Medjugorje, meaning any Catholic parish, any Catholic entity is able to officially organize pilgrimages to Medjugorje. Before, anybody could go to Medjugorje, but any Catholic entity was not allowed to officially organize. That ban has now been lifted. So there's never been a more exciting time to be somebody who loves and follows Medjugorje because the church is showing incredible support in all of the things that have happened throughout its history. Well, that clears up a lot. Thank you so much. And Catholics are saying, some of them, that you should not go there because it's not approved, approved. And what would you say to that person who is not going to go and telling others not to go? You know, that's an interesting misconception that people have. There's there's this misconception that you're only allowed to go to official places of the, the places that have been officially approved by the church. That's actually, not only is it not true, but it's actually contrary to procedure in the church. And let me explain why. Because when the church evaluates a place of apparition, they look at primarily two things. They look at, is it consistent with Catholic theology? Is there anything in the messages that is contrary to Catholic teachings? If there is, that's a very clear answer that it's not authentic. The second thing they look at is fruits. That's a big one. Okay, so let's just look at that issue of fruits. How do fruits manifest? Fruits manifest in people, right? Fruits, what, what that means is that there are conversions, there are healings, there are, there are vocations that are born of it, there are prayer groups that are formed, there are people who return to the faith, there are people who begin praying the rosary, there are people who return to confession after years of being away. All of those things are fruits of a place of apparition. Well, if people don't go there, there is no possibility for fruits to happen. Fruits happen because people go there. And so in order for the church to actually rule that a place is authentic, people have to go there. And really what the church teaches is that until the church condemns a place, it leaves it up to our own discernment as to how we're going to respond. Do we want to pay attention to this place of apparition? Do we not want to? The church trusts that we will use our own discernment, our own wisdom, You know, some people choose not to go, and that's fine. But the church does not say you cannot go. So, like, if you look at Fatima, for example, 
there were 70,000 people there. Fatima was not approved at the point where there were 70,000 people there. And if those people had not come there on that day, they would not have witnessed that great miracle. Those people had to be there to be witnesses to the great miracle that God was showing to the world in that event. In the same way, God is pouring out his miracles on Medjugorje. And if the people don't go, the world is not going to know about it. So for anybody who says you cannot go until the church approves it, that is absolutely not true. And the church has never said that that's the case. Very helpful. Number two, the apparitions, messages, and Medjugorje itself. Can you please address People who say they've gone on too long, this has never happened in the history of the church, that so many apparitions, so repetitive, so many years. Well, to answer that very quickly and easily, that's not true, that it's never happened in the history of the church. That's just blatantly not true. And let me share with you some of the other places where this has happened. Just so that I get this correct, I'm going to read this to you because I don't want to misstate anything, okay? So I'll be looking down to read, okay? So some places of apparition begin and end in the same year, right? So that's Guadalupe, La Salette, Lourdes, Knock. The same year they began, those apparitions ended. Other apparitions were spread over the course of many years. For example, Quebejo in Rwanda, eight years. Apparitions in Amsterdam in Batania, 14 years. San Nicolas in Argentina, 35 years and ongoing. Laos in France, 54 years. Fatima. What is this? So this is something that a lot of people don't know. Fatima, right? So the, the first year of apparitions was approved. So one year officially approved. But we know from the testimony of Sister Lucia that she continued to receive apparitions through the end of her life. Those apparitions, so that's however long she lived, 80, 80 more years of apparitions that continued regularly with Sister Lucia. So it's not true that apparitions have not gone on this long. So Medjugorje, really, Medjugorje is at we're at uh, almost 42 years with Medjugorje. So Medjugorje is not even near the, the kind of the upper limit of what has been the case in the history of the church. And by the way, even if that was true, that no other place of apparition has lasted as long as Medjugorje has, even if that was true, does that mean that God can't do it now? Like, why are we putting limits on God by saying, just because it's not, there's a lot of things that, the, that have happened in the history of the church that maybe were the first time that it happened and, and it became a precedent, right? It doesn't mean that God can't do whatever he wants, but we actually do know that there have been other apparitions that have lasted longer than Medjugorje. How about Medjugorje is too commercialized? Therefore, I guess Mother Mary doesn't want to go and buy any rosaries. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have to say that one kind of makes me laugh because anybody who know anybody who's been to any place of apparition or, you know, any place of, you know, the Holy Land, any place where anything has happened, that stuff is there, right? Our Our Lady appears there or has, has come to Medjugorje to the different places of apparition because she wants to draw people there so that graces can be poured out. Well, guess what? When people come, they need a place to sleep, right? They need a place to eat. They want to go home and bring a piece of that place back home with them. And so they, you know, they need, they want to buy rosaries. They want to buy prayer cards. They want to buy medals. That commercialism that, it, that happens around these places, it's just... I, Actually, I was going to say it's a necessary evil. I won't even call it a necessary evil. It's just something that happens because you need to tend to the needs of the pilgrims. When Medjugorje first began, the locals offered accommodations to the pilgrims for a long time in their own homes. They gave up their own beds. They gave them their own food. They gave them their own drink, and they never charged a penny. But guess what? That's a small farming community where people's income was minimal, and it wasn't possible to continue doing that. They had families to feed. They had children to raise. They had educations to provide for, right? And so they, it had to come to a point where in order to continue welcoming pilgrims and being faithful to their own vocations as heads of their families, they had to start charging. This doesn't mean that they were materialistic. It just means that they were offering what they could, but then at the same time asking for contributions so that they can do what they're called to do as, as heads of their families. It, to me, it's just logical. Yeah, there seems to be, if, if a Catholic tries to feed their family based on doing ministry, somehow that becomes evil. And yeah, I, I don't know where that thinking comes from. You know, are there people there that are financially profiting? Probably, you know, I'm sure there are, that, but that's, 
that's the human condition that will you will find that absolutely anywhere you go in the world from places of pilgrimage to places of business. But that doesn't mean that the whole place is wrong because maybe a few people are taking advantage of this holy situation. You know, I've also, we didn't talk about this in advance, but I've also heard the objection that the visionaries are profiting, that they're, they've got these fancy homes, fancy cars. Can you speak to that? Yeah. You know what? That's also, it's really unfair to place a burden on the visionaries that we don't place on ourselves, right? We all, everybody in this world, all the visionaries, first of all, are married, but they have children, they have spouses, they have bills to pay, they, just like the rest of us. And to have the expectation that they're going to live in poverty, that's not realistic. They're called to be responsible to their children. They're called to be responsible to their families. And if you have that expectation of them, why don't you have that expectation of yourself? Why don't you live in poverty, right? I mean, and also, it's important to understand that we're living in very different times than the times of Bernadette and of the visionaries of Fatima and Juan Diego from 500 years ago. These are very different times where expenses are very different. And I think one of the things that happens is people in Medjugorje, they see the homes of the visionaries and they think, oh, my gosh, these are huge mansions. But what people oftentimes don't realize is those, quote unquote, huge mansions are actually not the homes that. The, uh, those aren't fully their homes. Those are the, the that's where they receive pilgrims. Where they live is a small section of those homes. But just like all the other pensions and hotels that have been built up around Medjugorje, they had to build a place to welcome pilgrims so that they can feed their families, so that they can educate their children, so that they can go on vacation when they want to, you know, so that they could live a normal life in this world just like everybody else. They have the right to that, and it's not fair to expect that they're not gonna that they're not gonna live a normal life. And those sections that they have in the home is very, very modest. Exactly. It, I've been in those. Yes, exactly. Extremely modest. A couple rooms. It's yes. not whatever has been yes. lied about. Yes, exactly. Also, I remember pulling up to Mariana as one of the visionaries, and there's a Mercedes in the driveway. Oh. <laughs> so for Americans, Mercedes automatically equals wealth status Yes. Uh, a bit of an uppity nose. Sorry for yes. any Mercedes owners out there, but that is a, a judgment that America's put on that. Could you explain how that's actually the <laughs> Croatian Volvo? <laughs> it's so funny. That, it cracks me up when people bring that up because, yeah, exactly. People have this impression, oh my gosh, there's Mercedes all over Medjugorje. Well, guess what? Most of the taxis in Medjugorje are Mercedes. Like, And it's not because it's not because those are the most expensive cars. Most of the people who drive those Mercedes, those are Mercedes that are like, 20 or 30 years old that they get from Germany because they're a much better price because you can get a lot of life out of those cars. And so that's why so many people have Mercedes. They don't have the 2023 Mercedes L class or whatever, whatever the classes of the Mercedes are. They have generally the car, the ones that are older because they're reliable, because they're dependable. And so they go to Germany and they get them there where they can get them much cheaper. And like I said, most of the taxis in Medjugorje are Mercedes because as you said, it's like the Volvo or the Ford of Medjugorje. <laughs> yeah, that's thank you for bringing that one up. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, because that, that actually crossed my mind. I went, hmm. So I, I want to correct myself. Yeah. And, you know, these these visionaries, they have really, since they were teenagers, have changed so much. You have Mariana, and she's been fasting for decades, three times a week on just water. And you have yeah. Vitska, who's suffered, 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 suffered for souls and still has this beautiful smile on her face. She's, she's yes. quite the glowing saint. It's going to make me cry. So, you, you know, so yeah. they have a Mercedes in the driveway. Yeah. Or they have more than two rooms for their family. They have three rooms. Yeah. It's just not fair. And it's not fair. It's not fair. You know, I can share with you, I, I've traveled quite extensively with one of the visionaries as his interpreter. I've interpreted for, I think, almost all of the visionaries have spent various amounts of time with different ones of them over the many years that I've, well, from the very beginning since I've been involved in these events. And I can tell you, everybody has this romanticized image of what it's like to be a visionary. 
And, you know, the part of seeing Our Lady is amazing. I, I can't imagine what that is. You know, it's, it's, it is heaven on earth for them. It is the greatest grace in their life. But as soon as those visions are over, they come down to reality. And their life is just like the rest of ours, but even harder. Because ima- imagine if you're the last 42 years of your life, you've been hounded by pilgrims and had to answer the same question not thousands of times, but probably hundreds of thousands of times. You've had people pulling at you, pulling out your hair, pulling at your clothes, wanting to touch you. You've had people invading your homes, people coming into your private spaces, people wanting to touch you. And I I understand all that, right? People want some kind of a connection to the Blessed Mother, to heaven. But imagine you're on the receiving end of that. And for the most part, they are nothing but kind and gracious. You know, like you said, they smile. They, they answer the question as if they've answered it the first time. And so I just think we need to put it all into perspective and understand that they are just human beings who've been given this incredible grace. And I think it's unfair to judge them according to certain standards that are just not fair. I think one of the hardest things that they do is to answer the same simple questions. Maybe I would guess millions. Yeah. Millions of times. Millions of times. Can you imagine being gracious when you've heard, what does she look like? And you are answering it as though you've answered it for the first time. I know St. Juan Diego had to do that after the Guadalupe apparitions. He had pilgrims come and he told the story over and over and over again. If that doesn't make someone a saint, <laughs> I mean, just yeah, right, just that exactly. simple, sim- simple yes. problem. And you know what? Some exactly, and and sometimes if one of the visionaries was less than gracious after being asked a question a million, the millionth time or the seven millionth time, people uh, uh, make assumptions about them. You know, because bottom line, they are not saints walking this earth. They are normal human beings. And sometimes you wake up on the wrong side of bed. Sometimes you're tired. Sometimes you've had an argument with your spouse. Sometimes you're hungry because you've been fasting. And to have an expectation that they will always be perfect. There's nobody who's always perfect except for God, Jesus, Our Lady. And we can't, we can't have those expectations of the visionaries either. They're, they're normal human beings just like the rest of us. I can't stress that enough. And I would say they're doing a, an amazing job being normal they, human beings. Yes, they really are. I mean, they and, could they yeah. could be on drugs. They could be they could have turned this into be an ego thing, and none of them, none of them have approached that. And I can tell you from what I know of them, they don't seek notoriety. They don't seek fame. They're always trying to be in the background. They're always pushed forward into the spotlight because in a way, because people, pilgrims want to see them, people want to hear the stories. They're not after fame. They just want to live a normal life in their families. But they know that this is a responsibility given to them by Our Lady, by Heaven, and they take it very, very seriously. So we are already on this third point, the visionaries. This one, please address this one, because this is a lie that has spread far and wide in the English internet, and it's so evil. (laughs) Because it's wrong. Uh, the visionaries are faking it or lying as evidenced by Vitska flinching when poked in the eye. We're going to show actual footage of this moment that people use to condemn 40 plus years of the Blessed Mother appearing in Medjugorje. Despite all the evidence that this is a supernatural event, there's scientific evidence galore. They've been tested countless times by atheistic scientists who have come to believe but that all of that is ignored because of this one clip that will show you every week the virgin is said to appear to the young visionaries at a friday service belanger set up his camera and sat back to watch now they made the sign of the cross and uh, they begin the prayer our Father, and during that prayer, suddenly there is the beginning of the excessive kneel down, and they are in contact with uh, the Virgin Mary. If they're truly in ecstasy, nothing should distract the children. But suddenly, to Belanger's later amazement, an onlooker called Jean-Louis jabbed his hand towards Vitska on the right. 
At the moment of filming, I did not see that. Just afterwards, I saw that there was a commotion in the chapel. Everybody was disturbed because Vitska had reacted. Jean-Louis made a threat gesture against the eyes of Vitska, towards the eyes of Vitska, and uh, she reacted. And it was uh, for uh, Jean-Louis uh, uh, an important disappointment. Still frames from Belanger's video at the moment of the hand lunging at Vitska show her clearly recoiling from the jabbing fingers. Then the fingers of Jean-Louis are going back. Still no reaction for Vitska. A slight reaction, closing of her eyes. And then on the next picture, you have the spectacular movement of the uh, uh, face of uh, Vitska. She is reacting, going back. After the ecstasy, I had forgotten to stop the camera, and suddenly Vitska comes in with somebody else. She wanted to explain why she'd moved. In her trance, she'd been trying to prevent the Virgin from dropping the infant Jesus. So she said, when I arrived in the chapel, and everything was okay, when the ecstasy began, I saw nobody, and I heard nobody, except the Virgin Mary. And the Virgin Mary had the infant Jesus in her arms. And suddenly, I thought, said Vitska, that the infant Jesus would fall on the floor. So to impeach that, I made a gesture to impeach the infant Jesus to fall on the floor. And she thought that it would explain the reaction that she had against uh, the threat gesture made by Jean-Louis. I am so glad you're bringing that up, Christine, because I know that is one of, you know, it's so funny. It's like you said, that is one of the biggest points that people bring up. But like you said, they ignore the mountain of the rest of the evidence and point to that one little thing. So I want to ask you viewers to indulge me for a second. I will specifically address that video. But, I, but before I address that video, I want to talk about that mountain of scientific evidence, okay? So I'm going to use a visual aid here, okay? Here, I'm going to hold this up. Hopefully, you'll be able to see. Okay, so here's a paper that I drew up, right? Okay, can you see this? I, it doesn't, you don't have to read it. I'll tell you what it says up here, okay? So in, I want you to imagine you, you're looking at this piece of paper, okay? On this side, this column is all of the testing and investigation where results were found which support that the visionaries are normal, healthy, and experiencing something scientifically unexplainable. So this column, you, you're looking at a blank now, you'll see the full version of it in a little bit. This column will have every, all of the scientific tests that have been done that confirm that this, there's something of supernatural origin here. This side will have all of the testing that was done that show that Medjugorje is a lie. Okay, keep that in mind. Keep this paper with the two columns in mind, okay? So let's start with the column that shows the scientific tests that were done, which confirm that the visionaries are not lying, that they're normal and that they're healthy, and that what has happened to them is scientifically, un scientifically unexplainable. So first of all, in that first column, there was scientific testing done in, on the visionaries in 1981, 1982, 1983, 1984, 1985, 1986, 1998, 2005, and 2010. So those are scientific investigations, clinical investigations that were done on the visionaries. Now, let me read you a list of the medical and scientific experts, not their names, but their professions so that you know what kind of professions investigated them. So they were given a full battery of tests by general medical doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, neuropsychiatrists, neurologists, surgeons, ophthalmologists, otolaryngologists, cardiologists, neurophysiologists, psychoanalysts, psychophysiologists who look at states of consciousness, psychotherapists, oculists, as well as interrogations by priests, theologians, and commissions established by the church. That's all the people who've investigated them. Now, remember, we're still looking at that one column 
where we're looking at the tests done that confirm that this is scientifically unexplainable. Now, let me tell you about the testing that has been done. This first, this first batch of testing, it was, it's more on the psychological, psychiatric. So, and I don't even, you know, I'm not an expert in these fields. I don't even know what all these tests are, but I'm going to read them to you, okay? So first, a complete case history, medical case history, an MMPI, an EPI, an MHQ, a tree test, a person test, a Raven matrices, a Rorschach test, a hand test, a Valsecchi truth and lie detection test, computerized po polygraph, basically lie detector test, Holter arterial pressure and dynamic registration, pupillary reflexes, electrocardiograms, and numerous tests to ve measure various stimuli during the apparition, such as calling, touching, pinching, and shining bright lights into their eyes. So what I'm going to read to you now is a 12-point summary by the French and Italian Scientific Theological Commission on the extraordinary events that are taking place in Medjugorje. They came up with a 12-point summary. I'm not going to read you all of the 12 points, but I'm going to read you the main ones. One, on the basis of the psychological tests for all of the visionaries, it is possible with certainty to exclude fraud and deception. On the basis of the medical examination, on the basis of the medical examination, tests and clinical observations for all and each of the visionaries, it is possible to exclude pathological hallucinations. On the basis of the results of previous researches for all and each of the visionaries, it is possible to exclude a purely natural interpretation of these manifestations. On the basis of information and observation that can be documented, it is possible to exclude teaching or behavior of the visionaries that would be in clear contradiction to Christian faith and morals. In summary, accordingly, one can conclude that after a deeper examination of the protagonists' facts and their effects, not only in the local framework, but also in regards to the responsive cords of the church in general, it is well for the church to recognize the supernatural origin and thereby, thereby the purpose of the events in Medjugorje. Okay, so remember when I held this sheet up, this blank sheet, right? What I read was, uh, this is the side of all the scientific stuff that confirms Medjugorje's authenticity. This is the side where tests were done that show Medjugorje is not authentic. Now, let me tell you what those tests were. 1985, random guy that you just saw in the video, right? You just saw this video of the guy poking Vitska in the eye. The only test that was ever done that ever raised any questions about the authenticity, and we're going to address that in a second, is this video taken in 1985 of this random guy who's not a scientist, who's not a medical expert, who's nothing other than a guy who was president at apparition, who jabbed his finger into the visionary's eye. This guy's name is John Louis Martin. And what he found was that she recoiled and blinked. That's the only test ever done on the visionaries that seemed to indicate, according to this guy, that she was faking it. Now let's look at that specifically. To do that, I want to address some of the testing that was done on the visionaries. Let me just read this to you because I want to make sure that I have the correct information here. So during some of the tests, they remained insensitive to stimulation, calling, touching, pinching. No response, not even an indication of pain in the case of pinching or burning. A projector of approximately 1,000 watts was played on their eyes without causing any modification in the diameter of the, of the pupil. The eyelids continue to blink according to their natural rhythm. However, in the scientific tests that were done, blinking occurred spontaneously if their faces were touched. So in the scientific investigations that were touched, when they would poke, when they would touch their, when they would shine lights in their eyes and different things like that, they didn't have a blink reflex. When they touched the face in the scientific study during the apparitions, the visionaries blinked. Now, if you look at that video, re rewind, this, rewind this video and look back at the video. He is jabbing his finger in her eye, and it looks like he is touching Vitska. If he is touching Vitska, her, she is recoiling. And according to this, it's not unusual that she blinked because the scientific investigations that were done on them showed that when their faces were touched, they did blink. They did not blink when light was shined in their eyes, but when their faces were touched, they did blink. It looked like this guy touched her face, and it's not unusual that she recoiled either because one of the other investigations that was done, one of the things they did was they took the visionary Yaakov. They, during the apparition, they lifted him off of the ground. 
when they lifted him off of the ground, his legs just dropped like he had no muscle control. When they put him back down on the ground, still during the apparition, his legs went into the normal kneeling position. It was an involuntary movement of the body during the time of the apparition. So the body reacted. It wasn't that he didn't, he just kind of plopped on the ground. His body went back to that normal position because he reacted to that external stimuli. It's just as Yaakov's body went back to his normal position when they lowered him to the ground. In the same way, when Vitska's face was touched, she recoiled in a normal involuntary reaction. And when her eyes were touched, her eye, her face was touched, her eyes blinked in the way that they found in the medical examinations that were done. It's all completely consistent with what the scientific research has shown. So I'm satisfied. I've always wondered how to respond to that. There's another thing that people say, and they say, oh, she lied to cover it up. And she said, Blessed Mother was about to drop the baby. Can you respond to that? What happened after that incident happened where where Jean-Louis jabbed his finger in her eye, there was kind of this motion. All these people said, oh, look, she's faking it because he reacted. And 20 minutes later, she came back out and she was questioned about that. She was asked about it. Now, she has no memory that she that she was jabbed in the eye. She doesn't know what happened. Now, I watched that video. I Because I speak Croatian, I could hear her original answers in Croatian without, without having to rely on the interpreter. And in, in her answers, what she was speaking on, she didn't connect it to that whole incident of being jabbed in the eye. But what she was referring to was that previously in an apparition, it was an apparition where Our Lady was describing her life story to Vitska. So that whole incident, when Vitska is talking about that, she's referring to an incident that happened a number of years prior to that interview, where Our Lady was describing her life to Vitska. And in that apparition, Our Lady was holding the baby Jesus in a way that to Vitska's eye looked awkward. It looked like maybe the baby Jesus was going to slip out of her arms. But Vitska was very quick to add, I knew he wasn't going to, I knew she was not going to drop him. It just looked awkward to me. But let me, let me just add this to the baby Jesus appears with Our Lady only usually on Christmas. This was not an apparition on Christmas. So at this apparition, the baby Jesus was not even there. And so the fact that people say that Vitska gave as an excuse that Our Lady, it looked like Our Lady was dropping the baby Jesus. Well, that's, that just doesn't make sense because this was, would not have been an apparition where the baby Jesus was present with her. So there's several lies that we're looking at here. One is that uh, Vitska was faking it, that she wasn't really having an apparition because she, quote unquote, seemed to have a reaction when she was jabbed in the eye, which we've already explained what that really was about. And secondly, that she said it looked like the baby Jesus was going to fall out of Our Lady's arms. Those are two very clear lies that are just that just have nothing to do with the truth. So I just want to bring it home by showing you. Remember that form that I showed you at the beginning that on the one side, it was all the scientific testing that was done that confirmed that Medjugorje is authentic. And on the other side was all the scientific testing that was done that confirmed that Medjugorje was not authentic. Well, let me show you the form filled out here. I'm going to, you know what, just indulge me. Okay, here, this is all of the testing that was done to show Medjugorje is authentic. Here is all of, this is the guy who jabbed our lady, uh, jabbed Vitska in the eye. But look at this. Here's one page. Two pages of all the testing that was done. Three pages. And on this column, nothing. So I think we can safely say that, you know, one of the things actually I I, want to add, and I forgot to add, that Medjugorje is the most investigated place of apparition in the history of the church, primarily because the kinds of uh, instruments we have to measure all kinds of phenomenon to measure all kinds of reactions. They just didn't have in the time of Bernadette, in the time of the Fatima visionaries, they didn't have that kind of sophisticated testing. Medjugorje has been tested more than any other place of apparition in the history of the church. None, None of the scientific testing that has been done has, none of it has shown that there's any deception, that there's any lies, that there's any hallucinations, that there's any mass hysteria. The only, only piece of evidence that it's a lie is this random guy who jabbed his finger in Vitska's eye. And I think we can pretty much guess or we can pretty much assume that's not very scientifically credible. That's right. And I invite you to try to poke Anne in the eye and see how that goes. (laughs) 
I'm not sure what that would prove. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be pretty. I, I would have a reaction. <laughs> Well, Anne, this has been fantastic. You've covered the main objections and you've done it so well. You're the perfect person to do this. And would you join me in a prayer? Because I think it's important that prayer cover this and that as many people who have had those doubts and who've been fed those lies are told the truth to help Medjugorje, help Mother Mary do what she's been sent to earth to do. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mother Mary, thank you so much for being present on earth in these times in which we live. We need you so much. And it only makes sense that you've been attacked, that your followers have been told that they're in error. But this is normal. Persecution is expected. And Mother Mary, you are no stranger to persecution. So I ask you to cover Anne with your mantle, to help her to continue her pilgrimages and her ministry. And most of all, that we take heed to what you are doing in Medjugorje, that we help others to go there because it's a place of incredible conversion, literally like no other on earth right now, and hence such warfare against it. So please, I ask you to share this video, to discuss this video, and to take it to heart so that many, many people may find their way home. God bless you.